blessings, everyone. Welcome to Answers. I'm Dale, and I thank you so much for joining with me today. Uh, I, I just love the time that we had together here, and I do really appreciate it. Uh, I get all sorts of little feedback things in the most curious ways. I'll give you an example. I had one this week, and a, a lady walks up to me, and she just says, you know, my husband just loved the time together that he had with you. The time together, well, I never met him before. It turns out that he went to glory several months ago. But she started describing the various things that he talked about and the things that we discussed and things here and how he liked to just gather together like this. And so I never take that for granted, that, that we're here together in a very special way, whether it's a, a real-time type of thing when it's being broadcast on, uh, on the wonderful TV 27 here in Coleman. So y'all pray for us. We're in the process of, how do we say it, Nick, relocating? Uh, we're actually moving across the holler uh, to a more spacious environs, as they say. But you, you can imagine it takes weeks and months of just getting things prepared. And then there finally comes a time where you just go, hey, we got to flip the switch and move that fiber optic cable <laughs> and do this thing, you know. And everything has to be done just precisely. And it, it's quite an event, quite a work. So be praying for the station in the next few weeks and months as this happens. Um, so anyway, we do things live here, but then it's broadcast on the TV station. And then a lot of people watch us uh, on the Internet. So if you ever miss an episode on TV, you can uh, log on my website right there, and you can find it. It just says Answers TV. Click on it, and you can see the latest e episode, plus about another couple hundred. I don't know. There's a bunch of them on there. And so uh, anyway, I just thank you for your faithfulness and just gathering together like this. Uh, and what we do is on this program is we just simply look and see what the Word of God says about things. You know, today there's something that's been running through my mind because of several things that have been happening, some within the immediate time frame of our lives, some in the last few days, some further back, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just a word that I think that we need to be aware of, okay, and that we need to be prepared about, and we need to understand what is happening and what is going on. So here's the bottom line. Uh, the days are here, folks. The days are here. You see in Scripture in all sorts of places where we are forewarned, where we instru we're instructed, we're commanded to be prepared for certain days. We are to be prepared for today, <clears throat> but we know that there are days yet to come, and even days past that, when certain things are going to happen. The Lord himself told us that in the last days that evil is going to increase. We've had evil all along. We've had evil ever since uh, Adam and Eve succumbed to what Satan tempted them with, which was to break the one rule, right? We've had evil. We've had rebellion against God. But evil is going to increase, and it's going to increase in a way that I, I think that we really don't understand. A lot of times we say, well, I know it's going to be really bad. It's going to be like this. It's going to be like this. Yes, but I think it's going to be even worse than that. Okay? It's going to be very, very, very bad. And we're starting to see elements of that even within our own lives in the blessed arenas where we live. Okay? We are seeing, and, and I'm, I'm going to use these terms, but I'm using them really with compassion and, and love that I can't. But we, we are seeing foolishness beyond anything that could have really been imagined 20 or 30 years ago. And foolishness and idiocy, really, within arenas that in times past people would go, are you crazy? Even uh, evil people, even evil people of the world would have sat there and thought, well, that's just stupid. That's just dumb. That, you know, like that doesn't have anything to do with evil. But it does. It does. And what's been happening the last two or three weeks is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, the fact that now a center of major debate and a center of major economic warfare, are you ready for that? A center of economic warfare is occurring within restrooms. Can you imagine that, Nick? Within restrooms. Within restrooms. And you, we've seen it here, we've seen it there, because people are coming along and they're demanding and they're commanding that they want to live their life, as they say, and they want to identify as the gender that they want to identify with. And, and the stuff is just foolishness. Why do I use the word foolish? Because it is foolish, okay? Scripture uses the word foolish. It's very, very simple. Uh, we as humans are either male and female, okay? We're either male or female. And nowadays, we can determine beyond any shadow of a doubt which we are. We do that by DNA testing, okay? A, D a DNA test will determine, okay, this, that you are female or that you are male. Now, I will grant you, okay, up 50 years ago, up until then, uh, there might have been individuals 
that it would be difficult at times when they were born because there were certain physical abnormalities that you couldn't tell, is this a boy, is this a girl? Now, when you first tell somebody that, they think, well, that's a little strange, I didn't know that. Well, no, that happens. There's things that are a little, sometimes things are strange. I understand that. Okay, I understand. But at the cellular level, we can know beyond any shadow of a doubt whether somebody is a male or whether they're female. But now you come along, and it turns out that people say, well, I just always felt like that I was the opposite sex, whatever it was. I've always felt like, and now I want to dress like this, or I want to dress like that. Well, you know, that's fine. If that's what you personally want to do. And then you also get all sorts of dynamics. What does it mean to dress like a male and dress like a female? And Scripture actually uh, uh, talks about that in some verses, which we won't look at today, uh, about that you shouldn't do that type of thing if you're a man. But in some societies, what... Uh, you know, in some societies, a man will wear a robe which looks very woman-like, but no, that's the man's uh, outfit. The whole idea is the intention of the heart. Are you trying to come across as something you're, you're not? Are you opening your lives to something? And that's what happens here. When somebody starts pursuing things, you're opening your life to uh, entry of the evil one to uh, kill, steal, and destroy and pervert. So what's happened now is that people come along and they say, well, I feel like I'm this, so I feel, even though I am a male in every way, I feel like I'm a woman, so I want to dress like a woman, and I want to go into a woman's restroom, and I want to use the woman's restroom. Well, you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's happening with that and what the ramifications of that is. Okay, the ramifications. And anyway, it's already starting to happen, that people are, are being arrested because they're peeping toms, because they're doing this, because they're doing that. Well, at least they're being arrested at this point in time. The day is coming when they're going to go, oh, no, no, that's not their, uh, you can't arrest them because that is their civil right. Literally, the White House yesterday said that it is the civil right of somebody to come along and to identify as the gender they want to and then participate with, within all that gender identification. Oh, so I want to be a woman, then I get to do everything that wom women get to do, and I get to go to places where women are, even though I am a male. The White House said that. And that's what happened about two or three years ago where all of these various forms of perversion, uh, and it's very slick, it's very smooth, okay? It's very sharp, it's very uh, shrewd what's happening. They started labeling it as a civil rights issue, okay? A civil rights issue. So once that happened, then everybody's scared to death to say anything because you're going to be accused of being uh, 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 this or that because it's a civil rights issue. So what brings it to the head of late is what happened in North Carolina. North Carolina comes along and says, are you kidding me? You're crazy. We're not going to do that kind of stuff. They pass a law that says, no, if you're a man, go in the man's restroom. If you're a woman, go in the woman's. Okay, it's not a big deal. Do that. Well, then all the wise and the intelligentsia and the insightful and all these wonderful people said, we can't have that. And, of course, it starts with musicians. You knew it would. You know, Bruce Springsteen comes back and says, okay, I'm not going to do a concert down there because you won't let the men go into the women's bathroom. That's what it boils down to. And, I mean, it's just crazy. So all these other musicians says, we're pulling out. Then businesses come along and say, oh, well, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do this. And then uh, last night, Kurt Schilling, I know some of y'all know who he is, Kurt Schilling gets canned from ESPN because he made some tweet that made fun of this, that made a little humor about it. And ESPN said, oh, no, 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 we are inclusive. We are inclusive. We can't have people like that that would be evil like that and that would say anything that would be hurting to anybody. So let me tell you where it's going to start going, and it already has gone. We're reaching the point to where those, and, and the Scripture says this. Let me pull this up. This is in Isaiah 5, okay? Isaiah 5. And it's actually a woe. There's a series of woes, which means, hey, y'all better watch out here. Woe to those that do this. Isaiah 5, 20 says this. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. You've heard that verse in your life, haven't you? You've heard something related to that, but you didn't quite know where it is. It's Isaiah 5.20. Okay? Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. But then he gets a little more detail about it. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In other words, woe to those who call the darkest things of the world light and enlightened and call that which is light the revelation of the Most High God, the gospel of the kingdom of God that call that darkness. We're seeing it already. Okay, we're seeing it. And it's going to really, really start accelerating. And it's going to have an impact. And I'll tell you how it's going to really, really impact some things. Is you're going to see the point very, very soon where believers are going to be harassed to such a point that they're going to be arrested. Okay, they're going to be arrested. They're going to be hauled off. 
Now, and this is a word of warning I want to give all of us related to this kind of thing. Quite often, particularly in our society and where I am, our community and things like that, when you hear that somebody's been arrested, it's like, oh my, our automatic default position is they've done some form of evil, something has happened, their lives are over, I can't be around them anymore, this is horrible, what has occurred, what evil have they done? When that may not necessarily be the case, okay? Uh, when you really look at the scripture, okay, when you look at the scripture, <laughs> Uh, being arrested is sort of a resume enhancer. Who was arrested? Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, all the apostles. <coughs> and you see them being arrested. And they're arrested by the religious powers that be. They were also arrested by political powers, but particularly the religious powers that be. Not for doing anything in the wrong in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of man they did something wrong. So you're going to see the day come, and it's already up on us. It's already here, folks. It's been going on for several years, even decades, but we haven't seen it. We can sort of think these folks are sort of crazy kind of thing, but they're not, okay? There will be people that will be arrested. There will be false charges. There will be true charges where people are arrested for true charges because they truly have stood up and spoke and preached the Word of God, and they were arrested for it. It's going to happen from without. It's going to happen from within. I'll give you a couple of examples. And then we'll take a break and come back and uh, look at a scriptural example of what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to act and react on these things. Um, an example from long ago and far away, Patrick Henry. You remember Patrick Henry, right? Give me liberty or give me death. You know what that speech came from? He gave that speech before the Virginia House of Burgess. And he was on his way there. Okay, he was on his way traveling this thing because he was a representative. And he was supposed to go there. And he was passing through a small town, very, very small town. And in the midst of the... Uh, common area in that small town, you know, the court area in the, in the middle of it, he sees a guy in headlocks. You know the locks where they put your head in your arm like that and you just hang there and you're like bowed down? And he sees a guy in headlocks and he goes up and he starts speaking with this gentleman and asking what his crime was and why he was there. The gentleman was a Baptist preacher, okay, a Baptist preacher. And the reason he was in headlocks was he refused to purchase a license to preach the gospel. Virginia had passed a law, the state of Virginia, okay, not, the, not the United States, all the states, just the state of Virginia, had passed a law that you had to have a license to preach because they wanted to control what type of preaching was being done. And this guy refused to do it. He says, I don't need a license. Don't ever forget this. Anytime you see the word license, it means this. Permission to do something which otherwise you would not have permission to do. That's according to Black's Law Dictionary, I think the 1991 edition, my redaction of it, okay? Um, it means you have permission to do something that otherwise you wouldn't have permission. And he says, I don't need the state to give me permission to do this. I don't need that at all. And Patrick Henry was infuriated by that. And on his way to the House of Burgess, he kept thinking about that. And he got there, and that's when he got up there and made that great statement, give me liberty, give me death. That's not my favorite Patrick Henry. Let me give you my favorite Patrick Henry quote, then I've got to take a break real quick. It's this one. He was actually uh, uh, supposed to go and represent uh, Virginia when the, at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, we were gathering together because the Articles of Con uh, Confederation were working, but that needed to be tweaked some. And so they were going to meet together and tweak them. They didn't meet together and tweak them. They met together and they came up with an entirely new form of government, which is what we have now. But it was actually a, a peaceful coup d'etat, and Patrick Henry knew about it. He refused to go. When asked why he refused to go, he said this thing. Greatest Patrick Henry quote ever. I smell a rat. I smell a rat. He knew what they were going to be doing in Philadelphia, and it is what they did in Philadelphia. And the document that came out of it is the Constitution that we have now. Tell you what, let me take a real quick break, come back, and I'll give you a second example, a current today, of what we're facing and what's happening. So stay with me.
Hi, I'm Jay Mullins with Premier Bank. At Premier Bank, your deposits are insured up to $100,000. Certain IRA accounts are insured up to $250,000. And we've got an FDIC pamphlet here that will tell you how to insure up to $1,200,000. If you want your money to be safe, call me, Jay Mullins, at 737-9900, and let's talk. Welcome back to Answers. And my time flies by, I tell you, so hang in here tight. I want to go over several things. Uh, so here's the bottom line. When you hear somebody has been arrested or something like that, there's some things we need to do. First of all, don't jump and let your mind go flying somewhere. Particularly somebody that you know, somebody that, is, that you trust, et cetera, et cetera. Pray for them. Intercede for them. What if they made a mistake? But sometimes we make mistakes. I've had several friends that have made mistakes over the years. DUIs, things like that, okay? They drank too much and they shouldn't have been driving. I know some people that ate too much and they shouldn't have been driving because they go in a sugar coma. I'm serious, that type of thing. But it could be any number of things. But let me tell you what we're facing. Here's what's going on. I know of a church, and I just received this from somebody the other day, so it's secondhand, but I trust the situation. And this church had uh, a couple of ladies that had joined the church, and they were very forthright, and they said, we are lesbians. And one of them said, I'm a lesbian, I'm a lawyer, I know the law, and I don't want to hear anything I don't want to hear. Well, they took the threat, and they're adhering to the threat. So whenever they're there, they don't speak of anything that might be threatening to them. But when they're there, then they open up the Word of God and say, well, you know, this homosexuality thing is really uh, abhorrent in the eyes of God. He doesn't like it. But then they won't say it when they're there. See, it's that type of compromise and that type of thing that the church is really, really going to be tempted with. Okay? Really tempted with. We can't do that. We must stand firm we, on the truth of the Word of the Lord. We must do so lovingly. We must do so boldly. We must do so with humility with boldness, with compassion. Let me give you an example. Acts 12. I'm going to read you an extended passage. This is a story. So just view this as an account. This is what happened. So Acts 12, verse 1. And it says this. Now about that time, Herod the king, so Herod's the king, laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Herod went and arrested. He laid hands on those that were true believers, and he did it to mistreat them. He was furious with them. Verse 2. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword, one of the original apostles. Now, see, when you read the first verse, you think, oh, they're being mistreated. You know, they're probably not being fed well, this and that. No, they're being beat. They're being mutilated. They're being really mistreated to the point, verse 2, one of them was killed. He took their leader and killed him with a sword. And you think, oh, my, I mean, that, can that happen today? We see it happening worldwide. It's happening within our nation. It's starting a little trickle kind of thing. You'll have a pastor. This just happened a couple weeks ago. This has been happening for the longest time. Pastor standing on the sidewalk outside the courthouse step, handing out a pamphlet. Handing out a pamphlet. A judge hears about it, demands that he comes in. And then he says, no, I'm not coming in. So then the police out there says, come in here. The judge wants to see. He says, am I under arrest? He says, no, you're not under arrest. He says, no, tell the judge to come out here. The judge will not come out here because the judge knows he can't come out there and do what he wants to do. So finally they send him out again. And the pastor says, okay, in deference to the guest request, I'll go in for the judge. The judge goes in and says, let me see what you're passing out. And he shows him what he's passing out, and he throws him in jail. Because the thing that he's passing out is something that teaches about the Constitution and teaches about the law and teaches the truth about juries and jury nullification and things like that. People all times think it's about abortion and stuff. No, it's about jury nullification, which most people don't even know what that's about. I'll talk about that some other time. Throws the guy in jail because he didn't approve of it. See, that type of stuff is happening on a daily basis. You never see it within the media, but it's happening. So here, Herod is doing the same thing. He arrests some of these folks. He brings James in. He lops his head off. Now watch this, verse 3. When he, that's Herod, saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. When he saw that it pleased the Jews to arrest the folks of this sect, as they call, he went out and arrested Peter too. Then he gives us this. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, during a spring feast, when he had seized him, when Herod had seized Peter, he put Peter in prison, delivering him the four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. 
So you have Passover, the 14th day of Nisan. You have unleavened bread, which begins the 15th day of Nisan and lasts for seven days. So you have this eight or nine day time of Passover and unleavened bread, which is a high holy day and a high holy feast for the Jewish people. So he had Peter arrested at the beginning of it. He was going to hold on to him. And then after this time, he was going to bring him for the people. And Herod was just going to bring for the people and, 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 and expedite whatever his agenda was. Now watch this. Verse 5. <coughs> so Peter was kept in the prison. But prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. What do you do when you hear that one of yours is thrown in prison? One of yours is arrested. Okay? And usually arrest just means we're bringing you in. We want you to know we want to talk with you. We're going to set up a court date where we can talk with you. Okay? What do you do? The church fervently began to pray for him. Now, they'd already seen what had happened. Some of their own had already been arrested. Their main leader had been killed. So this just wasn't a little traffic ticket incident. Okay? They knew something was going on here. Next verse. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, so it's a few days later, and they're about to bring him forward before the people, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. So he's chained up, likely he's hanging on a wall, but we don't know. He's just, he's asleep. And guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. So he's got two guards right here at his feet, let's say. He's got two outside here. He's chained. Verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quick. And his chains fell off his hands. So he's either bound to the wall down like this or he's laid out, chained, whatever. He gets hit by the angel. I love the fact that Peter's sound asleep. He's sound asleep. He's going to get hauled before the people the next day, and he probably thinks that he's going to be killed the next day. He's at peace. He's asleep. So he gets up quickly. The angel says, get up quickly, and the chains fall off. Verse 8. Uh, eight. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandal. In other words, let's get ready. Let's go. And he did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. So he's waking Peter up, and Peter's sort of groggy, and the reason I know is because of what happens next. So he's saying, Hey, get your clothes on, get your shoes on, get your coat on, we got to go. And he went out and continued to follow, and, and Peter did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. Now, Peter had had visions. You can see him in Acts, earlier in Acts. He thought he was in the midst of a vision. When he passed through the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. So the angel gets him all the way out to the street. When Peter came to himself, verse 11, he said, Oh, now I know that the, sure sent, that the Lord has sent forth an angel right here and has rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. See, the Jewish people were expecting him to be killed. But the angel rescued him. Now, here's where I want us to go from where we are. So Peter is uh, uh, set free by an angel, and he wasn't even sure what was going on. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark. So this is John Mark's house, and this is his mama's house, Mary, where there were many gathered together and were praying. See, this is where they were gathered, and they were praying and interceding for Peter because they knew what was going to be happening to him. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came out to answer. So he knocked at the door, apparently, of a gate to a courtyard, not to the house itself. So you have a house, a courtyard, and then another gate. He knocks on that gate right there. Rhoda comes out there. She can't see him because apparently it was a solid door or something, but it says this in verse 14. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. So she gets to the gate. He's knocking on the door. Let me in. It's Peter. Let me in. She's ecstatic because she's hearing Peter back there. She's so overwhelmed with joy because she thinks that Peter is saved that she runs back in the house to tell everybody and she didn't open the door for him. Forgot to open the gate. Well, when she gets in the house, guess what they say? Now remember, this is the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ that is praying for Peter, that's fervently interceding to God on his behalf that he would be rescued, that he would be saved. Their response was this in verse 15. They said to her, you're out of your mind. That's what it says in the American Standard. You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. Which is an interesting thing. Because what they believe, uh, and, and the, the Jewish people believe this, and I think there's some truth to this. Uh, they believe 
that the angel that the Lord assigns to each one of us, which you see in Hebrews 1, that each one of us who are believers have a ministering spirit, an angel with us. A lot of times the world will call it a guardian angel, but an angel. They believe that your angel looks like you, to which most of us go, poor angel, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. They believe the angel looked like you, and when they heard this, first of all, they said, you're out of your mind, but then they thought, no, 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 it's his angel. And that would have been a real bummer to them because they, what they would have been saying then is that he's been killed. He's been killed. And his angel is here to let us know that type of idea. But Peter kept continuing knocking while they're arguing on the inside. It's verse 16. Peter keeps continuing knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent. In other words, they were just really loud. He said, be quiet, be quiet. You know, there's houses all around. He described to them how the Lord had led, them out of, led him out of prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. Uh, you find out in the next two or three verses that the next day Herod calls for him to come forth. They go to find him, and he's gone. Wind up killing the four guards that were watching over him because that's what happens to a guard when a prisoner escapes. But here's what I want us to do in our final 90 seconds together right here. Have this in your mind. They were praying fervently, and they prayed and prayed, and they believed. And yet when it was answered, they still didn't believe. They still could not believe that God actually did this. When we hear of these types of situations occurring, when we hear of these things increasing, as they will, and the evil gets more and more intense, and it gets more and more dangerous, and it's more and more threatening simply to say that the Lord loves you, and it's more and more threatening to teach and to preach and declare the Word of God, that we need to pray and intercede by faith and by belief, for one another, knowing that the Lord himself can break the chains and the shackles, not only in our lives, but in the lives of the most venomous, vehement, anti-God person ever. The Lord is the one that can break those chains and break those shackles. We are on the uh, precipice of the greatest time in the outpouring of the Spirit within the kingdom of God. But that's going to happen because it's going to be the greatest time of evil that is ever seen. We need to determine this day, what are we going to do? Prepare moment by moment by moment to speak forth the truth and to do so by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by the flesh, and then watch what the Lord does. I think we'll be amazed, okay? Hey, thank you so much for being with me, and I'll see you again next time.